This evening we're in Romans chapter 13. We're going to be looking at just one verse, um, the, uh, the end verse, verse 14. But I thought I would just read the, uh, the chapter just because it, it's good to get a refresher in this, uh, in this area, especially since chapter 13 does deal with what the Lord calls us to do in relationship to the state. That's something I think that we've all been having some difficulty with of late. But let's at least remind ourselves of that and also remind ourselves of what our Lord calls us to do with regard to any of our fleshly struggles and how we ought in all things to submit to him. Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes this, Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Wherefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes do. Custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. And this do, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Let us, therefore, lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now again, as you know, we are dealing with a series that has to do with putting off our sins and putting on Obedience, that is the fact that we have uh, died with Christ. We are literally, for all intents and purposes, at least we ought to see ourselves as dead. And we have been risen or we've been raised with Christ in order now to live for him. The fact is, now that God has actually raised us to life, and he has literally done that spiritually, we ought to give ourselves, our lives to him completely and fully to do his will. Well, we've seen, of course, a number of things. We've seen that that is, in fact, the case, but we've also been looking at various motives. I mean, as if um, what God has done for us to save us isn't enough. There were many other things we've seen. I don't want to rehearse those things again this evening, except to draw our attention to the one that we looked at last Lord's Day, which I thought is uh, quite a compelling one. And that is the fact that when we make the choices that we do, we put our Lord Jesus through certain things. The Lord is pleased when we do what is right, the Bible tells us, and his joy increases. But he is also grieved when we sin. So we actually, by our actions, are affecting our Lord to a certain degree. Of course, we're not going to rob him of all of his joy, but certainly the Lord is concerned about us, he loves us, and what we do will affect him. When we obey, we give him a greater joy. 
But we can also take that joy away from him through our sins, that joy that would otherwise be his, and which, of course, you know as well as I do, the Lord richly deserves. And the reason is because his heart is touched with our weaknesses, because he loves us so much, because he is intensely concerned for us. When he sees us go astray, it in some measure grieves his heart. Now that being the case this evening, let's begin to consider how we might more effectively do what it is we have been called to do, which is die to sin and live to righteousness so that we might please the Lord rather than be a source of grief to him. Now our passage, I believe, is a good starting point because it reminds us that since we have died to sin, that we are no longer to leave any room in our lives for sin, for our flesh, for our sin nature. And that since we have risen with the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to become like him in every way that is possible, at least that is possible in our present situation. Uh, we do realize that no matter how hard we try, we're never going to be exactly like him as long as we are in the body. We won't be like him until we're actually dead, in a certain sense, until we come to the end of our lives and we're perfected in heaven. And yet, we can make progress in this life, and we ought to be seeking to make progress. We ought to be striving for perfection. That's what it means to put on Jesus Christ. What is he but perfect? Now, again, this is uh, much easier said than done. So we're going to begin to consider just how it is we might be able to do this. Tonight, let's begin by looking at two things. First of all, the command to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to make no provision for your flesh. And then second, the one, at least one thing that the Lord has already done for you to help you do this. So first of all, the command. You are commanded to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to make no provision for your flesh. And of course, if the Lord commands you, that must mean that in some regard, at least as Christians, you are capable of making progress. Now, what does it mean to put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Of course, you know it doesn't mean that Jesus wants you to put on his appearance. Jesus doesn't want us just to don a robe and, and again, walk around looking like him. That's not what it means to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, or as one fairly high-profile character, not necessarily in our circles, but in Christian circles, who picked up a cross and carried it around the world. He thought perhaps the Lord was calling him to do that, and it certainly was a, uh, something to talk about when he'd walk down your street and he's carrying this big cross. People would ask him what he was doing. But I don't think that that's exactly what the Lord would have us to do. He doesn't want us to look like him outwardly. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to have his heart. He wants us to live as he would live if he were in our situation, in our relationships, in our positions, our jobs, or uh, if he were in the midst of his people, fellowshipping with them. He wants you to put on or to assume his character to have his love of what is good and right, his love of righteousness, his love for his father, his zeal for his father's law, his care for his people, even his concern for the lost. That's one part of his character, but let's not forget the other part of it, which is he wants you to hate what he also hates, to have his hatred of sin, for everything that is contrary to the Father's will, to his law, that is contrary to the Father, that dishonors him, that is harmful to his people, and that hurts your neighbor in general. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us that the purpose that the Father had in sending Jesus Christ into the world to do what it is that he did was that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, which means, among other things, that he might have the place of honor among a group of those who have been redeemed and transformed or changed who are actually like him, people who share his character, that have a heart for his glory, 
and who desire to give glory to the Father, who are willing to do his work, that work that needs to be done in the present time. So again, he wants us to be like him. At the same time, of course, the Lord says that besides putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, he wants you to make no provision for your flesh. Now again, let me just say as an aside, it's not that the Lord does not want you to take care of yourself, of course, to take care of your body. He wants you to do that. He just doesn't want you to leave any room in your life for sin. Now just as a sad but humorous side note, I think there's always these, these grand illustrations from church history where people misinterpreted scripture and went a particular direction. Of course, the outcome sometimes is humorous, sometimes tragic. But there were those in the history of the church who believed that statements such as this, make no provision for your flesh, meant that you should instead deprive yourself of all pleasure and of everything that, that might be of, of a comfort to you and live the most austere life that you can possibly live. Now, some people took this, of course, in a more radical direction than others. There was one person who was known as Saint Simeon, Stylites, I think is the way his uh, name is pronounced. And he was called that because he lived virtually his whole life on the top of a pillar. Uh, Carnes, in his History of Christianity, writes this, that after having lived buried up to his neck in the ground for several months, he decided to achieve holiness by becoming an ecclesiastical pole sitter. He spent over 35 years on the top of a 60-foot pillar near Antioch. Actually, uh, it was more like 37 years. He found that since he couldn't get away from people horizontally, he thought he would do so vertically. He found this pillar with this, um, this platform on top of it and thought he could get away from people by going up there, but I'm afraid as he spent more time up there and as he moved from pillar to pillar, uh, it drew more and more people to come and seek wisdom from him. <laughs> but you can imagine what life would be like up there and you can imagine, of course, what his personal cleanliness must have been like if he spent 37 years on the top of this pillar. Now, he did start a whole movement of people who did this. And um, again, the uh, hygiene was uh, terrible. Now, Carnes goes on to say that others lived in fields and grazed grass after the manner of cattle. A certain uh, a moon had, it's his name, had a particular reputation for sanctity because he had never undressed or bathed after he became a hermit. It seemed like the filthier you were, the, the better you were. Another wandered naked in the vicinity of Mount Sinai for 50 years. These, however, were only the fanatic fringe of the movement, and that is the hermits, and were to be found in the East more than in the West. I remember in one of my church history classes, there was one particularly holy man who had never bathed, never cleaned himself, and so forth. And as he would walk along, vermin would drop out of his beard. I mean, not just droppings, but the vermin themselves and so forth. And he was, again, considered to be an extremely holy man. Now, that's not what Paul has in mind. Okay. When he says, make no provision for your flesh, he's talking about your lusts, your sin nature, something which they seem to have missed altogether. Now, how can you put on the character of Christ if you would allow yourself to continue to practice that which is contrary to his character? Sin or flesh is opposed to God. It is hatred of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is hatred of his law, hatred of his people, and hatred of your neighbor. The Bible says that when Christ comes in to live in your soul, sin has to go. The Spirit of God will not take up residence in your soul until sin is broken in your soul. Even though sin, of course, will still be present in your heart, will often grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And so along with putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are to put off all sin, every sin. You're not to allow any of it any longer. Listen to what Peter writes. In 1 Peter 4, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Now one thing you should remember is that sometimes when the word flesh is used in the scripture, it means the sin nature, the old man, the corruption that's still inside you. Other times it actually is referring to your body. So when he says here to live the rest of the time in the flesh, he doesn't mean in, in the old man or by the power of that corruption, but rather for the will of God. And certainly the context will help you understand that. Now granted, that's what we're supposed to do. Put on Jesus, become like him, his character, his love for what is good and right and his hatred of sin. And we are to make no provision for the flesh. How can you do that? Well, obviously you can't do it on your own. You need the Lord's help. And if you are the Lord's here this evening, you need to realize that he has already given you that help. He's already done what is necessary for you to make the progress that you need. So secondly, let's consider what the Lord has done already to help you. And I've actually already alluded to it. He has given you the Spirit of God to break the power of sin. And the presence of the Spirit of God is really all that is necessary to bring about this transformation, to give you what you need to do what must be done. Now, there's really only one way to overcome sin. And that is when you deal with it, you have to deal with it as a whole and not only in parts. You can't deal with sins individually and expect to overcome sin. You have to deal with sin in general. I thought Ken Ham actually offered a grand illustration of this. If you've ever been to a Ken Ham uh, presentation regarding uh, creation science and the problems, of course, that evolution creates, he talks about the foolishness of Christians. He has the, you know, the diagrams up there. The foolishness of Christians who fight against the issues of the day by dealing with the issues individually instead of the foundation, which he identifies, of course, as evolution. And remember his, his diagram, he's got the two castles, and he's got you know, the castle of its creation, the castle its evolution, and all the people in the creation castle are shooting at the issues that are so many balloons over the uh, castle that's evolution, while the evolutionists are shooting down at the foundation of creation and making the castle crumble. And what he's saying is that creationists should shoot at the foundation, which he in, identifies as evolution, and not try just to pick off the, the fruits that grow from that particular hypothesis that is called evolution. Now, we need to realize that there's something even more foundational than evolution that's behind all these things, and that is sin. And the point is, you're not going to be able to deal successfully with sin unless you go for the root of sin. You can't fight against just the fruits of it. You have to fight against the root of these fruits. You have to fight against sin itself. You have to deal with the corruption that is in your heart. It's been pointed out that you're, you can't kill a tree by knocking all the fruit off of it. You actually have to attack the root of the tree if you're going to kill it. So that's what we have to do. We have to attack the root. We have to attack sin itself and not just individual sins. Now something more, of course, is needed. You, you must not only hate sin and all sin, but you have to love what is right at the same time, and you have to love everything that is right, not just particular duties. You know, just picking and choosing, I like these, but I don't like these. You have to embrace all of them. Now basically, you're fight against sin and your embracing of what is good and right of your duty must be universal in both cases. It has to be across the board. And the reason being is because if it isn't, then you're really not hating sin. You're really not loving righteousness unless you hate all sin and love all righteousness. I mean, you really don't hate sin if you only hate and fight against certain sins but not others. Because if you hated sin, you would hate and fight against every sin because they are sin. In other words, you don't hate sin if you're not fighting against every sin. 
If you're only fighting against certain sins but not every sin, then you're fighting against those other sins for some other reason than the fact that you hate them. You have to hate them all. And the same thing is true with regard to loving righteousness, to loving your duty. You really don't love it if you only love some of those duties but not all of them. Because if you really loved righteousness, you would love righteousness wherever it is found and you would do whatever it is that is good and right whatever the Lord calls you to do. So you must have a universal hatred of sin and the universal love of righteousness. Otherwise, you are not going to make progress. But let me point out that this is exactly what the Lord has already given you when he made you spiritually alive. This is what he did that made you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave you the Spirit of God. With the Spirit of God, He gave you a love of what is good, and He gave you a hatred of what is evil. That's what it means to break up the stony heart and to give you a heart of flesh. Now, here's another instance where the word flesh doesn't mean sinful or corrupt. Stony heart means sinful and corrupt, a heart that is immovable towards the Lord the Lord breaks it up and he makes it moldable. He gives you a heart of flesh. That's the new heart. That's the new nature, one that loves him. When he did that, he broke the power of sin in your life so that you were no longer a slave to sin because he changed your disposition towards it by giving you a desire for righteousness for what is good. And that desire for righteousness actually made you a slave, no longer of sin, but now a slave of righteousness. By the way, I should mention, if you don't like the idea of being a slave, you need to realize that everyone is a slave. Everyone in this world is a slave to one or another principle. There's only two, either a sin, either to sin, or to righteousness. You do need to ask yourself, which do you prefer? Paul writes in Romans 6, verses 16 through 18, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So you were the slaves of one, now you're the slaves of the other. That's true of you if you are a Christian. Now realize that if you had remained a slave to sin, that you would have perished forever. Because if you are the slave of sin, that results in death. But having become the slaves of righteousness, you will live forever because you love righteousness. Really, it's that desire for righteousness that turns this whole thing around, that breaks the chains, as um, Charles Wesley writes in his hymn, And Can It Be? It's what gives you the ability to fight against sin and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Through that one act, God has given to you everything you need to live the kind of life that he calls you to live. This is what the Lord has already done for you if you are a Christian, if you are a believer here this evening. But you do need to realize at the same time that the Lord has so ordained this process, as it were, that it's not going to happen automatically. It would be nice if that's all that was necessary in a certain sense. He gives you his spirit, and then everything just kind of works by itself and you slowly and gradually move up, up and up and you're becoming more and more holy every day and so forth. But that's not the way it works. If you are to make progress in putting off your sins and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, it will require work from you. Now, if the Lord hadn't given you a spirit, you couldn't do that. But having given you his spirit, there is something for you to do. There is something you must do. Now, you know, in Reformed circles, we do talk about the sovereignty of God in regeneration and making you a new creature, what we just talked about, giving you his Holy Spirit. That's not something you do. That's something that he does. He does that alone. You've heard the word monergistic, perhaps. It just means that God works alone. 
But sanctification, once God has given you that spirit, once he's broken the chains, once he's given you that disposition of heart that desires what is good, sanctification or growth in grace is something that requires cooperation between you and the Lord. We call that synergistic, which means you work with God. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So notice the command, you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. How can you do that? He says, it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The Lord will do what you can't do. You can't break the chains in your heart of sin. He will do that. He will give you his Holy Spirit. But once he's done that, you need to do what you can do. Now, he's done the most important part by giving you the new heart. But now you need to work putting off your sins and growing in obedience. And one of the ways, of course, that you do that is by drawing upon the resources that God has given to you in order to do that. God gives you the means of grace. We talk about the means of grace a lot, but knowing what the means of grace are isn't going to help you unless you actually go to them and use them. You know, you've got to use them regularly. You've got to strive and seek the Lord through those things. You need to use them a lot. The more you use them, the more you use them in faith, the stronger you're going to be and the more progress you're going to make. Now, we're going to explore the use of the means of grace in the next few weeks and how to deal with sin, again, in general. But realize this evening a couple of things. That growth is commanded. What does Paul mean when he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for your flesh with regard to its lust, except to grow in grace, to grow into the likeness of Christ, to grow in holiness. So know that growth is commanded, but know also that growth is possible. You can become more like Jesus Christ. You can become more useful to God. You can live a life that will add to the joy of your Lord and not take away from it. So growth is commanded. Growth is possible. But one, let me leave you with one last thought, and it's simply this, that for those of you who haven't trusted Jesus Christ, you need to remember that what Paul is commanding here is impossible for you. You will never be able to do what he commands here unless... Your heart is first changed, and that's something that only the Lord can do. I think you need to understand you're never going to change the way that you live unless you actually want to change, but you're never going to want to change unless your heart is changed, and only the Lord can give you that heart. So if you don't have that heart, if you don't have that desire to be free from your sins and to put on Christ, there is only one person who can give it to you. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to come to him and ask him to change your heart. And look to him until he does in fact change it. Because again, it's only through the power of a changed heart that you're going to be able to turn away from sin and obey the Lord. If you haven't trusted Jesus, if you haven't come to him for that mercy, for that grace, for that new heart, come to him now. Today is the day of salvation. Trust in him and be saved. May the Lord help us then to do what it is that we need to do as far as what we need to hear this evening, whether it be to come to Christ to be saved or to come to Christ for the strength to put off our sins and to put him on. We're under that obligation to do that. May God give us the grace that we, you know, to do what it is that we need to do. Well, let's... Um, Let's bow for a moment of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.